Before we start, I just want to clear up something about language. Here in Australia, uh, it's called the triple four Marlin. That's the norm, just like the 222 Remington is called the triple two Remington. I notice in, in North America, people are saying 444 Marlin or 444 Marlin, but it's all the same thing. That's just what it's called here. So I want to clear that up. Let's get G'day. started. Welcome to my uh, latest gunner review video. And today we're looking at this. This is the famous triple four Marlin, or to be more precise, this is a fairly early one. Uh, a triple Marlin triple four S is the model of the rifle. Now, uh, we'll go into a bit of history first. In 1893, Marlin brought out their model of 1893 which uh, was reasonably revolutionary at the time. The 1893 Marlin, although the receiver's pretty much the same size and shape, you've got this square bolt uh, with uh, flush with the outside of the receiver. Here's a close-up for you. Um, but different from the um, similar Winchesters of the time in that it was side ejecting, made it easier to mount sights on top. Um, and the other benefit of these is that you can actually remove the bolt and clean them from the rear of the action, which you can't easily do with a Winchester. I'll show you how to do that later on. Now these were initially chambered uh, in the first, when they were first brought out in 1893, chambered in 3240 and 3855. Uh, then when um, in 1895 when the 3030 Winchester smokeless cartridge came out uh, they were chambered for that and that's been the most popular chambering ever since. They were later chambered for a few other things 32 Winchester Special I think and I think there was also a Marlin 30, uh, 25 35 or something a proprietary Marlin cartridge which is long since obsolete. Now in uh, 1895 um, Marlin wanted to also, uh, Marlin and Winchester of course were bitter rivals, Marlin wanted to um, compete with Winchester in the market for the really big bore heavy rifles. Uh, Winchester of course had their model 1886 Like all the early Winchesters the 1886 model was a top eject design with the bolt locked by vertically moving locking lugs and compare, that's compared to the Marlin lever actions which were all side eject. In 4570 and 5110 or 5100, uh, 45, 45, 65, all those big old black powder heavy cartridges. Um, so what Marlin did was they actually they beefed up the receivers basically the same design but they just made the made the receiver slightly longer to take the longer cartridges and beefed it up and they brought that out as the 1895. You can see it's a very similar design to the 1893 just a, a longer receiver uh, and everything slightly strengthened for the much uh, much larger cartridges. And uh, that was chambered in 4570, uh, and possibly some of the other big cartridges I can't quite remember. But 4570, of course, was the most popular at that time. So now, if we fast forward through to about 1962, I think it was early 60s. Um, lever action. Hunting rifles are still very common, especially in North America, but there hadn't been a big bore lever action rifle made for a very long time. I think the 86 Winchester was finished in the 20s or 30s, um, and um, there was a 348 Winchester, I think, um, but that had sort of become obsolete in the early, um, early 50s, I think it was. So Marlin saw a sort of marketing niche and decided that they would uh, they would bring out a big bore um, lever action rifle. 
And it's funny that they didn't actually just make a 4570 because the 4570, of course, was still in regular use. But I think they probably they probably wanted something that was really souped up, and they were worried about uh, the whole, you know, the old tractor or Springfield and having high-powered 4570 cartridges um, that would be unsafe to fire in a tractor or Springfield or any other old 4570 um, firearms. The 1893 Marlin. Uh, in 1936, it had a facelift, uh, and I think that's when they introduced this style of um, ejection port and bolt. Um, but the rest of it was still very similar. I think the internal internal parts were similar. Um, but there was a move in the 30s to get away from this whole 1890 something um, nomenclature, both in both by Winchester and, and uh, Remington and. Marlin because it just made them sound old fashioned and they wanted things to sound modern. So they called it the Model 36, not the 1936, because they didn't want it associated with a year. It just wanted it to be a model, Model 36. Um, in the next few decades, they added the 3 and called it the 336. There was probably some modifications, I'm not quite sure why. And so basically, that's what this is it's the 336 um, action. Probably slightly beefed up from the uh, from the 3030 version. Um, so in, yeah, in the early 60s, Marlin decided they wanted to produce this big bore rifle. So they got a beefed up big uh, 336 action. Um, put a I think it's a 22 inch barrel. Not only 20, it's probably only 20 inch barrel. Let's measure um, on it. But they decided that they wanted a new cartridge. So um, they, in, in conjunction with Remington, they, they got together with Remington and they actually designed this new big 44 cartridge. So same four size as the 44 Magnum, but a case about twice as long. But it's not, you can't actually fire 44 Magnums in a triple four chamber. The actual, they made it so that the rim and case head are slightly different. So. Um, so they produced a triple four. Um, now, history shows us that usually when companies produce a proprietary cartridge that's only produced by themselves in their own right, um, it doesn't go so well. People are a bit suspicious of it. They know they might buy a, buy a firearm, which then you know, after a few years they're not going to be able to get ammunition for or whatever. So, so it never really it didn't it never absolutely took off. Um, there, was a, there was a small uh, group of firearms enthusiasts who saw the benefit of it uh, and they got into it. So there was a small but consistent following through the 60s. Then I think it was in about early 70s or maybe late 60s, I can't remember the date. I'll put it up if I find it. Marlon, um, Marlon thought, what could they do to kind of boost sales? And then they realised that they probably made a mistake right from the outset, as I said, introducing a proprietary cartridge, and they probably should have just um, chambered in a 4570 right from the very start. So that's what they did. They actually brought out, they called it the 1895 Marlin after the old 1895 4570 from a century before. Um, and uh, and they bought basically the same rifle out, same action, but in 4570. Now, um, so some of the um, features of this rifle. Uh, it's got general buckle on sight, folds down for use with a scope or peep sight. Just a normal kind of uh, uh, ladder type sight. Front bead with a, uh, with a hood. Now the barrel is actually a micro groove barrel. If you're not familiar with that, instead of having about six deep square sort of grooves in the rifle, it has I think 12 small shallow grooves. This was something that Marlin introduced back to about that time uh, and used in a lot of their rifles, including the 3030s and some of the others as well, uh, possibly even the 22s I think. Um, you know some people say it's worse, some people say it's good, some people, I don't know whether there's really that much difference to be honest. Um, but another error I think they did make at the time
time. They made several errors. In, in hindsight, they made several errors when they when they did this project. The other error they made was that the rifle barrel is a one in thirty six twist. I think it is. So it's actually quite a slow twist rifle. And the reason that they did that was because there wasn't really any properly constructed 44 bullets projectiles available. So they were going to be using your standard 240 grain 44 magnum projectiles. Uh, and that's what the Remington load was. It was just a Remington 44 magnum 240 grain projectile going at about 2400 feet per second, I think. Um, and so that's all that was there. such a short, short, stubby little projectile. Um, that was all that was needed to stabilise that. Um, and there was really no large projectiles available for it. And that was one thing that caught them on a lot of criticism. People said, you've got this great big bloody case, full of powder, big, nice, heavy rifle, fast action, um, and then you're firing a pistol bullet out of it, which is not constructed for big game. It's not designed to go 2,400 feet per second, um, and it's likely to expand too quickly and not have proper penetration, and all of those things are probably true. So that was another thing that, that made it such that um, it wasn't as successful as they'd hoped. Um, now what Remington did after a few years, because of that criticism, they actually brought out another load, they brought out a 265 grain um, Load. I'm not sure where, where that projector was. They got a special, or they designed a special projectile for it, or whatever. But that load was available for a few years, but there still just wasn't enough of a market for it, and they quietly dropped it after a while. So it went back to to um, to the 240 grain pistol bullet load. So for many years, this was the only rifle that was actually chambered in triple four marlin. Um, so, um, but they continued making it um, through this one's made in 1978. Um, in the 19, I'm not sure exactly when, I think probably in the about 1990, somewhere there, um, they actually modified it um, in some ways. One thing that they had to do, even though like, a lot of people don't really like it, is they put a cross button safety on all the all the marlin lever actions. They put this cross button safety, which has to do the same thing. It was just such that you know these these rifles have a safety. They've got a half cock safety, but just modern general kind of laws and whatever meant that you had to put a safety catch on every rifle. So they put um, put a put a um, cross bolt safety on here. And um, well, hammer block safety actually it was. It was just here somewhere, so maybe just here. So a block when it went across, it was, the hammer would still fall, but a block of hammer from falling, um, or from hitting the target. Um, now the other thing that they did was they actually took on more of the criticism about the micro group barrel and the fact that it wasn't very popular, and they actually introduced what's called a ballard rifle barrel. Uh, which is just basically a more you know, deep kind of six screw or whatever rifle barrel and they uh, increased the rate of twist to one in I don't remember. I'll put it up on the I'll put it up on the screen for you, I'll look it up for the for this publishers. But basically what it meant was it was more like this this sort of rifle could now cope with um, larger, heavier bullets and cast bullets, according to popular law. Now, um, as far as the triple four marlin goes, as I said, for many years this was it. This is all that was changed, the only rifle that was changed here. Then I think in probably the 80s, there was a few um, other firearms they chambered it in. Um, there were some single shot ones, like the, um, I think the Harrington Richard Hand rifle and these were built on H&R's uh, uh, standard single shot shotgun type action, um, but just modified uh, to uh, to be a rifle. Probably strengthened a bit, I guess. Uh, but uh, very simple, but quite good firearms. 
The Thompson Centre contender uh, was designed specifically for high-powered cartridges uh, and uh, suited the triple four. It came in both pistol configuration and also in a rifle configuration. Those break action rifles were quite simple, just to, uh, all they needed to do was put a barrel and chamber. They chambered some of them in triple four. Um, there was the BFR, the um, Magnum Arm, um, big giant revolvers, they made a big giant single action revolver. BFR stands for Biggest Finest Revolver. These giant revolvers are popular with uh, large game hunters and also for uh, long range metallic silhouette competitions. The triple four arm. Uh, then, in, as it started getting a bit more popular, Winchester had their big bore Model 94, um, beefed up Model 94 in the 375 Winchester calibre. Very high pressure cartridge, I think about 65,000 psi, something like that. Um, and they um, they saw an opening, and so they actually modified their big bore uh, and chambered it in triple four mile. Winchester called their triple four version of this rifle the timber carbine. Um, they were only made for about two or three years, uh, right at the end of Winchester. Um, from about I think 86 to 89 and I think Winchester went bankrupt at about that point and uh, they wouldn't, weren't made after that. Only for a few years, I think it was just before they kind of went to farm. Um, but there is a few, there's very few uh, 94 Winchesters and triple four out there. And apparently they're so strong, like this triple four Marlin I think is uh, rated to about 42,000 PSI. And these things were rated up to about 60,000 psi. So I have read things about hunters in North America just beefing their loads right up to 60,000 psi and bringing them up into true magnum sort of territory. So, um, yeah, then I think Marlin, Marlin of course, was bought by Remington some years ago and um, the triple four was quietly dropped at some stage, I'm not sure when, but it hasn't been around for quite a number of years from Mull. Um, but just recently, um, two things have happened. One is that uh, Remington, Mull, under the ownership of Remington, have actually uh, brought out the Triple Four again, and they've called it the Triple Four S, I think, the same as the old one. Um, and the other thing that's happened is Pedasoli have started reproducing the um, 86 Winchester. They're doing a copy of the old 1886 Winchester and they're also changing that in triple four mile. So, yeah, so it's sort of still plodding along, really. Um, so that's the, um, that's the history. So as far as my, uh, my uh, work with this rifle, a few years ago I sort of thought I wanted to get it out and have a bit of a go at doing more than just the 240 grain pistol bullets. So I did a lot of research on the net. What I heard, I was told when I got this rifle many years ago, was that you can't fire cast bullets in a micro room barrel. And so I just never did. I just used to use those 240 grains. found some really good articles. And what several of, uh, several of them suggested was that this, the whole thing about not being able to shoot cast bullets in a microgroup barrel is actually a myth. Um, but you have to follow some rules. Um, about 350 grains is about as heavy as they'll stabilise. And you have to drive them fast. They have to be going fast enough to get enough you know, rotational stability to actually stabilise. So, um, and the other thing they say is that because of the microgroup barrel and the tiny little um, rifling, they recommend um, loading at 3 thou over size, so about 0.4 through 2. Um, so, um, so I did that and, uh, and I actually had some pretty good results. It actually shot these uh, 
thing I, I, I'll, show, I'll show you that I'll be talking about a little bit later on in the video. Um, I, I ordered a special custom model, 330 gram gas check, specially designed for the mall, um, cycling and everything. And um, it shot very accurately, about 1900 feet per second. So, um, pretty hefty sort of velocity for a big ball like that. Uh, so I was quite happy. So I mean, I've never had a chance to shoot in a large animal with it, but if you want to go and shoot a buffalo or a scrub bull with it, that would be uh, pretty much um, you know, 330, 335, 330, I think it's a gas check is close to 340 gram. Bullet at um, close to 2,000 feet per second um, should do the job. Now I'll show you some of the features of this. So. Simple lever action rifle. Um, this uh, peak side is a Lyman. Uh, I can't remember the It's actually specifically designed for the, for the 336 Marlin. It's interchangeable with the, with the you know, 330 ones. Um, that's the other thing. These, these early rifles are drilled and tapped for scope mounts, and they're also drilled on the side and tapped for these sights, whereas the ones that were made later, I don't know about all of them, but I know someone that's got an early 90s one um, with valid rifling and cross spot safety and that has no drill and tapped holes. So if you wanted to mount a, any sort of side on it, you'd have to drill and tap it. So that was obviously a cost cutting measure. I'm not sure if anybody is a Remington made or not. Um, so what I might do now is I might um, show you, um, oh that's the other thing too, is this uh, the butt plate, that's, a, that's called a Pac-Man decelerator, which is a big front brand model of the butt plate, really soft new print. Um, this one's called the pre-fit model, it's actually made for the Marlin 336, so it's not a perfect fit, you know, because it's got a little bit of overhead in places, but basically it means you can just take your butt plate off, buy one of these, and screw it on, and it kind of does the job. And I did that when I started not working at those heavy loads. I've still got the original butt plate, I'll keep that. Um, five shot capacity in the magazine, big long cartridges like this, one, two, three, four, five, um, one in the chamber. So what I might do now is I might show you how to um, field strip it. Right, so I'll just show you how to uh, uh, just partially dismantle the rifle for cleaning. Uh, now the first thing you've got to do is open the action just bring it back so you've got about a half an inch. I'll just cock the hammer first for my help. Bring it back so you've got about half an inch or so of space between the end of the chamber and the bolt. Um, and then we just need to get a screwdriver that fits this screw and remove the screw. And that lever will just come out. Now the bolt will come out. You may have to just, so there's a little bit of extra spring so that bolt will still get the hammer. But if we pull that hammer back, the bolt will come out like that. Now you'll notice inside here, there's a, um, you can see the ejector there. Now the ejector just sits in a slot and has a little peg in it. Um, so you just, get something and if you just grab the ejector you can pull it out like that so you just got to make sure you don't drop that and lose it and uh, that's the rifle stripped uh, now I'll see if I can show you that there we go I don't think it's going to focus on the rifling but uh, if it could focus if you look down there with your eye you can actually see the micro groove rifling the fact that it's just got all these tiny little grooves Now, before we put it back together, I'll just show you the bolt. So we've got, um, and they, uh, where are we here? There we go. Extractor. There's the slot where the um, where the lever sits. Uh, we've just got an extractor there. So there's not much to it really. Extractor's sort of just a spring-loaded thing that's just kind of held on to the um, to the bolt. Now, one thing here you'll notice is it has this. Um, this is a Marlin design system. This went way back to the early Marlins, I think. 
um, see how the firing pin is actually in two parts. There's the main part here, which is the cartridge, and there's this little rearward part, and they're broken. And you see this rearward part is actually spring-loaded, so when nothing's impinging on it, it's actually pointing down against this hard face of the bolt. So if something were to hit that firing pin there, um, it's not, gonna, not going to uh, cause the cartridge to fire. So it's, it's basically an out of battery safety. And the way that works is in the back, in the, in the action here. Stop that from rolling away. See this little thing here? So it's just to disappear back inside. Got it all come out. Well, that's actually pushed by this part of the uh, of the lever. So when the lever pushes that up, when the bolt's fully closed, the lever pushes that thing up, and that actually pushes that back of the firing pin up so that they're lined up and the rifle will then fire. Right, to reassemble, we just basically reverse the process. Oh, before we before we do anything, we need to put the ejector back in. So you see that little peg there, little peg on the ejector. Normally you can actually see that poke, see that in a hole on the on the side of the receiver here, but it's actually hidden under that receiver side. So um, anyway, we'll just put that here. Move the camera so you can see that slot. So you basically just get the uh, get the ejector, put it in that little slot there. And if you push it down, you'll actually feel the you feel that locator fall into its hole. And you can then put the bolt in, put it back a bit. And the bolt then retains the the um, ejector. Pull that back till you've got that half inch space there again. And this should just put it in there, give it a bit of a wiggle. To get back a touch more. There we go. Line the hole up. Go. See that's that lock there that's pushing the firing pin up in position. There's also a trigger block safety here. See that there? So um, that's a lever safety. Winchester has the same thing in there. Um, so um, so that unless the unless the uh, lever is completely closed, the trigger is blocked. Well, we're here showing you how to clean it. I thought we'd just have a quick look at the uh, the markings on it. It says the Marlins Firearm CO Corporate Company or Corporation, North Haven, Connecticut, USA, model 444S, micro group barrel, caliber 444 Marlin. We look at the other side. Just, no, it's just a warning, warning for using gunnery doses, manual, etc. for safe operation. Um, have a look at this as a, um, I think this is, this is a Lyman, Lyman site. Um, I think it's called a 66 LA. So it's specifically designed uh, for the Marlin 336 action. Um, it's got a standard, Standard um, size apertures, replacement apertures. This is a target one, this one with a really small aperture. Um, but uh, they give you another smaller one, smaller aperture with a big hole, big hole in it. Uh, but there's a standard size. So the, um, all the Williams and Lyman um, peep side apertures have the same thread. So uh, I've got a whole variety of apertures that have come on various different sites that I've got that I can try. Um, the early ones of these sites had the actual, had the calibrations here engraved into the steel. They've actually gone a bit cheap now. This is just a, 
um, just a flat piece of printed sort of aluminium, aluminium that's just screwed on there with a little screw so it slides back and forth. Um, so you can actually set the zero on it. Um, I don't think I've ever bothered really doing anything with it. But um, and then on the side you've got a similar sort of thing. You've got a you've got a piece of aluminium that's printed. Um, I've got that set at zero, so I think I did zero the elevation to the to the two forties. I think I've written somewhere. I think it's thirty. I think you have to actually go right up to thirty on here um, to to be on at fifty meters with the big three thirty grainers because they obviously drop a lot more than the than the high velocity ones. Um, up of that site. I think that's a marble site uh, with the folding down folding down uh, leaf which is quite handy when you when you're using the peep site. So I have a bit of a closer look. So we've got um, we've got the uh, pistol grip type stock. Now um, some of the later ones of these I knew a guy that had a uh, 4570 8090 um, it was an early 1895 in 4570, so it was probably from the early 70s. And his actually had a, a straight grip stock, so um, I'm not sure. And I think some of the, some of the um, maybe the really early 444s might have had a straight grip stock. I think I've seen photos of those. But yeah, it's got a nice stock. Um, plastic kind of grip cap. Um, Walnut stock, of course. Um, this one's got QD swivels on it. I think the rifle actually came with the with the um, with the QD um, swivel studs. Kingsgate four end three quarter magazine and. Uh, Bead front sight with a um, with a hood, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to see the. Uh, just put this over the light whether you'll be able to see the actual micro groove rifling there. Yeah, it's very shallow little grooves. Uh, talking about um, the original factory, I might just thought I'd show you this. Now this this is a box of factory ammo that I got from, I got it with a whole heap of other shooting related stuff from a deceased estate. Um, I don't know exactly how old it is but I suspect it's at least, at least probably as old as my rifle from the 1970s. Um, and I've never fired it, it's actually still got the original uh, original cartridges. So um, as you can see the box is a bit worse for wear. Get this out without ripping the box. So, um, so yeah, these are the original 240 grain Remington. See, they're a soft nose flat point um, triple four cartridges. Um, so yeah, so they were the original cartridge that were designed for the rifle. As you can see, quite a short nose, just a normal 44. I think it's just this was. I think this was probably just a Standards probably the same bullet that was available in 44 Magnum 240 grain loads at the time, uh, and I'm, I'm, I think they're still the same. I think the if you buy a box of triple four Marlin Remingtons now, it'll be the same projectile. Um, and I've got another box here, um, triple four ammo. Um, see, it's got a barcode and everything on it, uh, but I think it's they call, see they call it Express Rifle, which is obviously their big game sort of rifle range um, but I think the cartridges are the same it's a uh, 240 grain soft point so I think it's still the same I won't show you the cartridges because this was actually um, um, uh, the Australia Zoo you know Steve Irwin's Australia Zoo is just near here and um, the uh, the one of the the guys from the zoo were at the range one day apparently where they had a triple four marlin and a box of ammo and they kind of fired it off and 
and then they said to the range officer, oh, what do we do with all these cases? And he was nice enough to say, well, I know someone who's got a triple four. So next time he saw me, he said, oh, so I've got something for you. And gave me a box of indicators. So, um, but yeah, anyway, that's, the, that's what the new box looks like, but the, the cartridges haven't changed. One thing I forgot uh, that I should have done when I was showing you the cartridges as a um, comparison was to show you the comparison with the 4570. Um, of course, that's the cartridge that, you know, it's the triple four has been most compared to. And of course, once they started chambering the 4570 and the 1895 model, you basically had the two cartridges chambered in the same rifle. So there was always going to be some comparison. So as you can see, very similar size cartridges. The triple four has a slightly longer case, but of course the 4570 has a bigger diameter. Um, so the 4570 is going to have, um, if we look at the base of the bullet, um, the actual volume of powder is probably going to be comparable. The, four, the 4570 is probably just slightly bigger. Uh, of course, in, in a lot of the single shot rifles, they used to use four to 500 grain bullets in the 4570. Um, but in the triple in the four, you're limited to about 350 grain. I think this is, this is a factory round actually someone gave me, and I think this is a 350 grain um, round. So, um, so if you look at it, you know, you, you might get more powder in the 4570. Same, when, I mean, there's a 240, but of course, you know, I could load a 330 grain bullet into the case. Um, your, um, so a three, three, say 330, 350 grain bullet in a triple four compared to a 4570 is going to be longer. The bullet's going to be longer, but of course it's going to take up more case capacity, but it's going to have a higher, a better ballistic coefficient. So I think it's probably, you know, they're probably comparable. Um, the 4570 is probably just got the edge in power. Um, but, um, but I don't think that you would notice any um, discernible difference if you were shooting in the field. Here we have um, some of the um, projectiles that I use for reloading my triple four. Um, now this one here is an Hornady XTP standard 44, 240 grain pistol bullet. It's got the hollow point and the little little cracks to aid expansion. Um, I've only ever shot one pig with my triple four, that was with one of these. Uh, it wasn't a huge one, it was at about 50 metres and uh, I hit it in the chest and it just went over like it was poleaxed and never, never even kicked. This is a Remington uh, hollow point, as I dropped it on the floor a minute ago, it's got a big dent in the side of it, but take no notice of that. Uh, obviously that lead at the front is quite soft. Um, they shoot okay too, so that's another 240 grain. Here's a 30 millimeter group that I shot at 50 meters with one of those Remington 240 grain jacketed projectiles. I was using 49 grains of AR2207 which is sold internationally as Hodgden H4198. So as you can see it's a pretty good group for a open sided This one here rifle. is a, uh, it's an ideal mould. Uh, this is a Thompson design. Uh, this one gas checked, uh, lubed and gas checked. This one's 258 grains. And this one here is a big one. Uh, this is a, a custom mould that I designed through the Mountain Mould website. If you're not familiar with mountain moulds, I'll put a link uh, below. Now, this is what I'm going to talk about most because uh, this is one, as I said, it's a custom mould. So the important thing with the lever action is the length of the bullet from the crimp, where you're going to crimp it to the front, because it has to be able to eject, as I'll talk about um, shortly when I show you some cart loaded cartridges. Now... Uh, as I've said, um, the literature states that um, 
about 300 to 350 grains is about as big as you're able to stabilize in the low in the slow twist microgrid barrels of the early rifles and um, so I decided that I'd uh, so when I designed this bullet um, I wanted one that would cycle through the chamber this I was aiming for about 330 grains um, two nice big lube grooves gas check um, it's designed to drop from the mould at point, about 0.433 so it's about 4 thou over bore diameter and I then um, loop size it in my loop sizer um, down to 0.332 uh, so it's actually 3 thou oversize and again the, the, um, the literature suggests that in these big big ball cartridges uh, in the microgroup barrel having them several thou oversize you know increases accuracy and it has been the most accurate bullet I've tried this one cycles fine through the action has a hefty recoil um, but really quite accurate um, and um, I've never hunted with it but this would be the sort of bullet you'd be using if you're going to hunt something really big like scrub bulls or buffalo or something like that I should just mention how I came up with this design um, now on the if you look on the bare tooth bullets website they have a forum on there and there's actually um, a section I should might even be a section on there on uh, either on Marlin big balls on triple fours or something but anyway there's a there's quite a few um, quite a bit of literature on there uh, and there apparently there was a guy called Glenn Flixell who was a gun kind of writer or something in the States who was experimenting and he actually designed a bullet for the triple four um, but his was I think from there was a few years ago I did this I think his from memory was for the later model with the with the Ballard rifling and the faster twist and he designed like a 400 grain one or something but basically it had it actually had the um, all the all the um, dimensions because when you design these bullets what you do is you say okay I want it this drop this many grains I want it gas checked I want this many grooves and then it says I think the actual from the crimp groove to the front you ask for that measurement and as you as you're putting these measurements in it actually is drawing the the um the bullet for you and then there's something called the meplat i'm not even sure how it's, how it's pronounced m-e-p-l-a-t and that's actually the flat bit on the front and it's the percentage of the total diameter that the flat bit on the front makes up and so i copied that as well i used the same meplate, plate i used the same bullet length i basically just copied his design but made it only 330 grains rather than 400 or whatever his was uh, and that's how I got it so I'm pretty sure this one has a 74% MEP plate um, I can't remember all the dimensions I might be able to find I've got it all written down somewhere online in a, in a file or something I may or may not be able to find it if I do I'll put it up for interest but otherwise anyone who's got a triple four who wants to go through this process you can easily just you know do a bit of research and you'll find on the mountain molds website uh i'm oh, no, sorry on the bed well mountain molds mountain molds also has a it might have even been on there mountain molds has a forum bear tooth phillips has a forum and the marlin owners website has a forum with a triple four section in it so that was those are the three places where i I did a whole heap of research when I was kind of mucking around with my marlin some years ago and getting this mould organised. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's not too hard to kind of do all that if you want to do it. And these mountain moulds are great. You just kind of plug it all into the computer um, and then you just push, you know, buy and it, you know, there's a kind of website thing where you pay with your credit card and then it's a big aluminium, you can get one or two cavity or whatever. It's a big aluminium mould. Um, I'll, I'll actually show it to you I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the video to show you what it looks like but really well made and really easy to use and drops nice bullets and um, yeah it was the whole process was actually quite easy and actually really successful this is the 
mountain molds mold, as you can see, it's made of aluminium. Uh, with a nice big solid steel sprue plate. And uh, now these are actually designed to use just standard Lee um, handles. So you can just take your, you know, just take your handle off one of my other Lee moulds and use it on it. So uh, there you go, I just got the single cavity one. Um, but uh, you, know, you can still mould them fast enough to make a few. Uh, it's not as if you're shooting hundreds at a time. You wouldn't want to. Well, it kicks you around. This is a screenshot of the Mountain Moulds design page for my uh, big 330 grain mould. So I'm just going to leave it up here for a little while. If you wanted to uh, copy, copy the dimensions, you can actually design your own mould in the page. I'm not going to go any further into this process in this video because I am intending to make a separate video on designing a mould from the Mountain Moulds website. Right, so this is just... Um to show you some of the, the cartridges uh, with some of the uh, different projectiles that I, uh, I discussed before. So this is a uh, Hornady XTP. This is a Remington 240 grain pistol bullet. This one is the 265 grain Thompson uh, from a Lyman mould. Um, I'll actually find, I'll get the mould number for, for you and post that. Um, and this is my mountain mold uh, one that I designed online. And we've just got a 30-30 cartridge and a 22 long rifle next door just to um, give a bit of perspective as to the size of the cart, the triple four cartridge. Now you'll notice if you look at the overall length, the this one and this one are pretty much the same. Um, this one is similar, and that's because when I designed the mould, it was actually specifically designed to have a, uh, a, 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 no, a front of the bullet in front of the crimp groove, which was within a certain length, so it would cycle no problem through the rifle. Um, now this Thompson design, you can see that the actual um, the uh, projectile is actually a little bit longer. All right, so this is one of these Thompson Thompson longer nose Thompson um, project uh, cartridges. So we'll put that in the King's Gate and we'll load him in like that. I'm not going to plug, as I said, it's quite safe unless you. So, um, so I still have not as you can see, I still haven't closed the lever there, so the firing pin's still not going to be complete. But the the ejector extractor has slipped over the cartridge. Now, if I pull that back. Moving the microphone a bit. See how that's catching? It's actually catching in the front of the chamber. See that? So, so I've met the end of my lever stroke and the cartridge hasn't come out. Um, and, but what I did discover is if we, what I'll do now is I'll just, we'll see if we can do a bit of an action shot. If we do it fairly enthusiastically, it will it will eject. Um, you see, it just kind of catches the very corner of the of the projectile, and you see the little shiny spot on there. But that's not a big deal. What I did initially, uh, when I thought that was a problem, was actually I was loading them to look like this. I was loading them right so that the crimp was actually over the front of the shoulder of this semi wad cutter style bullet. Um, but they don't shoot quite as accurately like this because you know you've got more free bore till they hit the rifle. And, um, so in the end, I discovered it's there's really no point doing that. Um, it's fine just to just to load them up as normal, and they're quite a quite a good projectile. They're nice and long. They're almost touching the lands um, with the shape of bullet. They're probably actually within the lands because the bullet's got that got that taper on it, uh, and they're actually quite accurate. These. So, um, and they're not quite, they're bigger than the, slightly longer than your standard 240, so a little bit better ballistic coefficient. They cut nice round holes in the target too. 
So, um, so yeah, these are quite a good one. And th this particular mould, they come up on eBay secondhand really quite commonly. I quite often see them. So um, if you've got a triple four, it's worth keeping your eye out for that. Uh, there is another projectile that I've actually got that I've shot and used, and it's okay, but I just, I just haven't got any to show you. And that's the Lee, there's a 300, I think it's a 310 grain Lee um, plain, I think it's a plain based mould, which I've got. And I've loaded them and chopped them and they can they kind of shoot okay as well. I'll just show you the Lee, uh, Lee heavy bullet mould, 310 grain. This is probably a good option if, you know, if you don't want to, if you're not that serious as far as getting a custom mould, but you just want to go and, you know, you want to try some heavier cast bullets in your triple four. So there's the three, 430, 310 RF. So that's, C means it's a gas check mould. Um, so you can see by the shape, you've got your jack gas check shape at the back bottom. Um, 430, so it throws them back 430. Um, it actually throws them heavy, it throws them about 432, about the same as my other mould actually. Um, 310 grain around those flat point. So I, I did mould some of these and I did try them. I, I was sort of concentrating on that, my, my um, uh, custom mould at, at the time. So I didn't really spend as much time on this one as I possibly could have. But they did shoot okay. Uh, they cycled and shot okay. The um, the actual um, length of the nose from the front crimp groove to the front of the bullet is about the same as the other uh, other ones, so it doesn't get hung up. It cycles fine. Um, as you can see, you've got um, uh, two. You've got your two um, two smaller crimp grooves at the front. Uh, so you can. That means you can actually decide whether you want to crimp in the front or the back groove. I think I crimped it in the front. Um, you could try the back one, I guess. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's probably something I should do a little bit of a uh, little bit of work on this one and um, get a bit more information. But anyway, then you can see you got a big a big loop groove in the middle, and then you've got your um, your gas check uh, um, a little uh, reduction in diameter at the base. So I can't even, I can't even show you a projectile from this because I just. I, I used it when I initially was working on the rifle quite a number of years ago and I haven't actually moulded any since so um, anyway I thought I'd just show you that one. Here I am at a club shoot I'm shooting those Lyman 429, 244, 255 grain lead projectiles just simply because I had a heap of them loaded and that's what I had to take along to this shoot I was intending to show some footage of a rapid fire lever action uh, event at this shoot but unfortunately at the last minute my cameraman was asked to grab his rifle and go in the same detail so he was unable to film me so I'm apolog I apologise that I've only just got this pretty boring single shot shooting footage. Here's the target from that uh, competition I was showing you. Uh, it was 20 shots in a maximum of 5 minutes. I probably didn't take that long. As you can see, uh, a lot of the shots are quite accurate in the 9 and 10 ring, but as the barrel heated up, uh, we started getting a bit of stringing which is to be expected for a rifle with a tubular magazine but there was only really that one real flyer so that's the triple four marlin if you like this sort of thing please feel free to subscribe to my channel and push the like button and until next time thanks for watching